All right, I want to welcome all of you to this um, this webinar that we're holding today. It is, I don't even know what day it is, August 14th, 2019. As you can tell, it's kind of early in Alaska. My name's Janet and I'm uh, the Polar Trek uh, Education Project Manager. And I'm joined today with Judy Fonstock, who um, we're behind, the behind the scenes host for this webinar today. Um, I'm going to be sharing a, a PowerPoint for Monica and Craig. I'll let them say hi while I get ready to uh, pull that up. Um, and uh, what's gonna happen is today for most of this presentation, we're gonna see um, the research team and uh, the educator here in a small little box while we see the presentation on your screen. Um, this event is being recorded and we will uh, share it out with you um, when we're all done. Um, so with that, I'm going to start presenting here. Um, as we go along, if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat box and um, to everyone and then uh, um, We'll respond to them and relay them to uh, Craig and Monica as we go along. And then at the end, you guys can all also ask your questions live. If you're in a classroom or you have a lot of background noise, um, you can mute your um, microphones and you can even stop your videos for this part of the uh, presentation. Um, and that just makes it a little bit easier in case uh, something is happening in your background and we can still hear the presentation. Um, so uh, while we get started here, if you don't mind, please say where you're joining us from, the school or your home institution. If you have anybody that is um, in your room with you, please note that as well. Um, I'm located in Anchorage, Alaska and um, we'll hear more from Craig and uh, Monica about where they are. Uh, before I turn this over to uh, them to present, uh, just a little bit about the program and why Monica's up, up in the far north and in the Arctic. She's part of Polar Trek, and it's a program that's hosted by a nonprofit that's primarily based in Fairbanks, Alaska. It's called the Arctic Research Consortium in the United States. We've been placing teachers and informal science educators with uh, researchers like Dr. Tweedy um, for a long time now. And uh, they go into the field to learn about the different kinds of polar science and bring that back into their, um, wherever they work, either a classroom or um, a science uh, institution. So uh, to date we've, We've had over 160 plus educators that have had experiences like this. So we're really excited that uh, we're able to um, provide this opportunity for, um, for educators and researchers as well. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, if you have questions, you can type them in the chat box as we go along. That's the best way. Um, and then um, <coughs> We'll relay those questions if we can um, and interrupt our team to have them respond to them. And then of course, at the end, you'll be able to ask your questions live. All right, I think I'm done with my little bit and I'll turn this over to Monica and Dr. Tweedy. And do you guys just tell me when you, just like say next slide or something like that. Okay, great, Janet, thank you. Um, so hello everybody. Um, like I said, we're here in Barrow, Alaska, the northernmost point of the United States, uh, right where the Chukchi Sea and the Beaufort Sea meet in the Arctic Ocean. And uh, we are right now, currently I'm in my fifth week of my Polar Trek Fellowship. And uh, um, I wanted to say hi to everybody that's joining us today in uh, my classroom and all the students at Santa Teresa High School and all the students joining us from Gadsden Independent uh, School District. Welcome. Um, and like I said, I'm a science teacher. I currently teach chemistry and AP chemistry. And this is uh, going into my 14th year as a teacher and educator there on the border town of Santa Teresa, New Mexico, right near El Paso, Texas, in Juarez, Mexico. <laughs> Hi everyone, good morning. Um, my name is Craig Tweedy. 
I'm uh, a professor at UTEP. Uh, I'm in the biology department, and I also serve as the director of environmental science and engineering. So uh, I'm originally from Australia, and uh, I moved to the United States in 2000 and began working uh, on various research projects up here in uh, uh, Barrow, Alaska, and elsewhere throughout the Arctic. So. Uh, um, yeah, you'll hear a bit more about the work that we do, uh, that Monica's been uh, a part of, and uh, it's just wonderful to, to see you all join today and, and share uh, uh, the experience that Monica's had here over the last month or so. So welcome and uh, look forward to your questions. Hi everyone, so like we said, we're coming from, uh, the good thing with our research project is that once uh, I come back, to the classroom next Monday. Next Monday, I will be back in the classroom, guys, letting you know. <laughs> so once I return, um, the fellowship still continues with us because uh, Dr. Tweedy works at UTEP, which is only about a 20 minute drive from Santa Teresa High School. So Dr. Tweedy and the entire team is uh, excited to be able to continue working in the classroom this coming year and uh, saying hi to everybody. And so we will be continuing uh, working in the classroom, which is very exciting. Um, and like I said, we come from the Southwest borderland where our summer temperatures right now are usually in the high 90s to the mid 100s. So very, very dr drastic change from where we are right now in Vero, Alaska. So we traveled uh, over 3000 miles to be in uh, Vero, Alaska and a very drastic change where if you notice we're all bundled up uh, we can go anywhere from the high 30s to the mid 40s and it is very wet. Um, since I've been here, I think the sun has only come out once and it's just been uh, cloudy and foggy. So very, very interesting, very different uh, weather than what we're used to in, in the sunny borderland area. And then uh, can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. So, Barrow, Alaska is uh, currently it is called Utkavik, Alaska, formerly known as Barrow. And uh, if you look at the map, you know, it's right at the northernmost uh, part of, the, of Alaska. So it is the northernmost portion of the United States, the northernmost city. And we stand uh, currently 350 miles above the Arctic Circle. And uh, right now we are located in what we call, uh, formerly known as NARL, which is the Naval Arctic Research Laboratory, which is now the Barrow Arctic Research Center. And it's run by UIC Science, which is a corporation run by the local Inupiat uh, um, tribe as well. So we have a very close connection with them. And uh, like I said, in Utkivik, it has been very, very cold. Um, sometimes out in the field, uh, it is a tundra. So the tundra, what we notice is um, there's permafrost underneath the ground and then there's a, a top layer of active layer of soil, which is very, very hard to walk on. I mean, part of doing field research involves, I mean, long treks. Sometimes we are, you know, doing work and we're up to our head in mud and it's wet, which makes it even colder. And um, sometimes we're out on the ocean as well. And uh, yeah, when you come back from an ocean trip, it takes you all day to feel your limbs again. So it's, it's very cold, tough, rough weather. And we have to do all of the field research out there carrying very different types of heavy equipment. So it really tests your mind and even your, your physical strength to be able to walk in this heavy, difficult terrain. But the science is just that important. We have to do the science. We have to gather the data to find out what is going on here in the polar Arctic regions. So next slide, please. <laughs> So if you notice, yes, we've had a, a quite a, a different um, experience for me here in, uh, in Utkivik. Um, we are looking at currently at uh, some of the research involves uh, looking at permafrost <coughs> and seeing why there is a, a vast amount of coastal erosion happening uh, here in the Arctic Ocean. And if you notice at the picture at the top, um, that is coastal erosion. So part of the land is just, uh, it's falling into the ocean right now and that's 
part of the research team is uh, our research team is going in and looking at this and drilling permafrost cores out of the coast and trying to find out well what is in that perm permafrost and what's causing all this to happen and and how we can learn from this um, and we look at all as as we do our research if you notice there's a wal a young walrus there um, who just happened to come up near our boat at the time and uh, he wanted to pretty much puncture our boat when we were there. So we had a very, very close encounter with the walrus that you see there. Um, and uh, so very, very interesting place. Um, and lo a lot of, uh, we are mainly uh, headquartered here. So a lot of our research, it, do it does come from the Barrow Haute Quebec area. And uh, next slide, please. <laughs> so part of my research also involves traveling to different places. So um, I've been traveling throughout the north slope of Alaska to different places that research, polar research is conducted with Dr. Tweedy's team. And our team consists, sometimes we will have um, five, ten people working uh, at headquarters and sometimes we'll have up to 20 and depending on all of the research projects um, the team runs uh, over six major research projects that um, that encompass requires for us to be out in different places in northern Alaska so Tulik Field Station is just another place that I had the opportunity to be there for about a week and it's geared towards supporting scientists in the Arctic and it's run by the University of Alaska and supported by the National Science Foundation. And um, it runs about 189 miles north of the Arctic Circle. So it's a, just a different field station where we had the opportunity to fly different types of drones and conduct LIDAR, <coughs> LIDAR research as well. So we conducted LIDAR, which we're looking at the different types of terrain. And, uh, oh yes, next slide please. <laughs> We're looking at different types of terrain. And the good thing is about implementing drones and LIDAR is it makes areas that were not accessible, accessible to us now. And sometimes with the technology driving forward and the advancement in, in these new data collection tools, it makes it a lot simpler for us to, instead of carrying all this major heavy gear or trying to track vast amounts of, um, and hike vast amounts of rough terrain, we're able to use technology in order to conduct the research. And if you notice there at Tulik Field Station, um, it's, a, it's off the Brooks Range, so there's this mountainous region, extremely beautiful land, uh, very rough terrain to walk on. I um, experienced many, many different, uh, almost near misses in, in twisting your ankles. It's just the toughs, and um, the terrain in the tundra is, is, it sinks you in and it's, it's nothing I have ever experienced out uh, working in and walking in the desert, in the Chihuahuan desert where uh, I originally come from. And also, if you notice, I've been wearing a mosquito net. Tulik Field Station has some of the biggest mosquitoes I have ever encountered. I mean, they, they look like flies and they just, they're, they're swarm you. And if you don't wear uh, bug protection and, uh, and mosquito netting, you're, you're in trouble. You really are in trouble. And um, just like I said, in the North Slope of Alaska, we travel to different places. So the next place, um, next slide please, would be um, Atkasuk. Atkasuk is a place that is very different from Tulik. Tulik is a major research hub for, uh, ex uh, for explorers and expedition um, people that come and, and study Arctic um, education or polar research in, in the region. So people come from all over the world to look at what's happening in the pole region. And Atkasuk is just another place. Um, and this one is very different. It's an inland community. It's only about a, a small town, about 250 residents. And the uh, Northern Alaska relies on shipping and uh, planes to get all of their resources. Um, there's really, there's, there's not very many roads. You, you, most of these places you get through in a small plane ride. And usually, I, I usually uh, go from Barrow to Atkasuk and it's about a, 
an hour, 15 minute to an hour plane ride, a very small plane, and you carry everything in, um, all of your food, and you carry all of your gear, and it's just a very different place. And, and the, air, the airport is only like um, a strip of runway, and you just drive your cars right up to the plane and you unload. Uh, very, very different uh, than going through all the TSA checks when you go to a, a major airport. And it is a remote research facility of, um, it consists of a small house that uh, you have maybe about 10 researchers that can stay at a time. And it is 290 miles north of the Arctic Circle. And so it's still very high up there and, and the weather can range. And the thing, oh, next slide, please. The thing what I liked about Atkasuk, it is very, very pristine and it is very, uh, it seems very untouched. So when we were out there, we would trek and uh, take our ATVs through the mud. And I mean, we got the ATVs stuck in the mud and we had so many different difficulties trying to get to these remote locations. And um, it's just amazing, amazing when you're doing field research and you look out and a caribou is staring like right at you and different types of vegetation that I have never seen, different types of grasses like cotton grass. And uh, a cotton grass, I would describe it as just a very, very heavy duty dandelion. It's like a dandelion on steroids, you know, cotton grass. And also different types of berries that grow out there. Sometimes you find blueberries in certain parts. And, and I was very intrigued if you notice the picture of a salmon berry. So salmon berries, they, they, they have a, a tart taste. So very, very different ex experience that I've experienced here um, with berries and vegetation and, and wildlife. And if you notice the planes, the air, small airplanes are the only way you get in and out of Atkasuk. And then uh, if we can continue to the next slide. Um, Monica and Craig, just before you get into the science portion, there were a few questions from the elementary school. Yes. Um, they just want, they, uh, one student wanted to know if you're near the Himalaya mountains. No, we are not near the Himalaya mountains, um, but we uh, are near the Arctic Ocean. So we're looking at the North Pole region, the North Pole region. So, um, a different place, but just, it, it feels very cold. So it feels like you can be in the Himalayan mountains at times, very cold. <laughs> and then they also um, have one more question and then we'll let you move on. Have you got, have you been bitten by any insects? Um, you know, the biggest thing that I noticed when I walked the tundra out here and, and I was just talking to some other researchers about this is the tundra right here in North Quebec and Barrow, um, when you're walking in there and you're like in the mud and um, you're walking in these tall grasses, I'm always looking out in our region, we always look out for, for like rattlesnakes. Well, there are no snakes here in Barrow. So it's just something in the back of your mind when you're always looking at, out for rattlesnakes and insects and ants. And it's, they, they have insects, but it's not, there's no ants, there's no rattlesnakes. So um, just very, bears. huh? Just bears. just bears. Yeah, I think our biggest our biggest experience is looking out for polar bears. That's uh that's the big danger here. Is uh, is we are conducting field research out in the middle of nowhere, and uh, whenever you see something move and it looks a little uh, light colored white, you always have to stop and think. Wait, is that a polar bear? Because most likely if a polar bear is near the vicinity where, where you can see it, it can see you. And in that situation, you are, um, you are prey, not predator. So that's, that's the big danger there. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, I think we're ready to move on to your, this slide where you talk about the, uh, your research. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so we have uh, several different projects, uh, and many of these projects are funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation. Um, this first one is the International Tundra Experiment, and in this experiment, what we're doing is warming the tundra and seeing how plants and vegetation and 
terrestrial ecosystems respond to that warming. So the site here in, uh, in Utkiavik is part of an international network. And uh, we've had these sites running since the early 1990s. So it's one of the long, longest uh, uh, warming experiments uh, anywhere in the world now. So, uh, so over the years, we've been conducting the same measurements uh, year after year after year. And these long-term data sets uh, are providing some of the best insight into how Arctic ecosystems will respond to climate changes in the future. So uh, yeah, there's some cool websites there that uh, will point you to all sorts of interesting uh, findings and data sets and pictures of, of uh, our ITEX uh, program. Um, so yeah, feel free to, to jump on there and, and check it all out. Uh, some of the key findings that we're coming up with there is uh, obviously as you warm Arctic tundra, different plant species do better or worse than other plant species. So uh, warming the Arctic will appear to change the different uh, vegetation that's present here. So we're expecting in the future with climate change to see a lot more shrub growth. Um, we're likely to see a loss of uh, mosses and lichens. And of course, these are all very important uh, plant species to the different wildlife that, that feeds in this area. And also uh, to, to the people that, that live in this area. So um, Monica was just saying that she went to Atkasuk. Um, a lot of the, the community there uh, at this time of the year are out on the tundra collecting their berries. And uh, those berries are an important food item to help them get through the winter. So a lot of the people subsist uh, in this area off the, off the landscape that surrounds their, their villages. And so understanding how vegetation um, and ecosystems will change is not only important for uh, understanding you know, the, future, the future world, but it's also important to help and communicate these findings to villages so that they'll know kind of what the future is likely uh, to be had for them in, in, in moving forward and how they can subsist off, off the landscape. Do you know anything? Yeah, yeah with the ITEX program, I have learned quite a bit about uh, drone work, how we use drones to map out grids, to look at vegetation, to look at the landscape. And with all of this information being processed, in the database, you're able to see trends and changes, hoping, uh, seeing what vegetation is actually thriving and what is um, how technology has helped us with all of this and how instead of a person trekking through the tundra trying to take these measurements, we can use drones um, in order to see what changes in vegetation are occurring at the time. So next slide, please. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, last year we were funded uh, for developing a long-term ecological research program up here. And this is part of a, a national network that's funded by the US National Science Foundation. And this program is designed uh, to help researchers uh, do science uh, where they're asking questions that are, are relevant to a particular region and where those questions can only be answered with long-term data sets. So, what we've noted up in this region for the past few decades is, is dramatic change as a result of climate change, uh, particularly in our coastal um, areas. And so we've got this new LTER experiment funded um, along the Beaufort Sea Lagoon, uh, in, in Beaufort, Beaufort Lagoon ecosystems along the, the Beaufort Sea coast of northern Alaska. And so what we're doing here is looking at at this transition between how climate change is impacting terrestrial uh, coastal systems and the lagoon environments that basically border those coastlines and then how 
the changes in those lagoons impact uh, the nearshore ocean environment. And so this is, uh, a lot of people find it difficult <clears throat> to understand that at UTEP, uh, which is located in the Chihuahuan Desert, that we actually do some marine biology and some coastal research. Um, and so this is a really, really cool, it's a brand new project. Um, this year we were up in April for about a month. Uh, and at that time of the year when we're sampling, it can be easily you know, minus 20. And uh, we're drilling through ice and sampling the, the lagoon environment underneath that ice. We're up here sampling right at the breakup period. So this is where this is rapidly melting with uh, the sunset. Uh, Craig and Monica, you guys are breaking up. We don't hear you anymore. I think your bandwidth, you're also frozen a little bit. Can you talk a little bit? All right. They might have just disconnected here. So let me stop their video. See if that helps them. I think we might have just lost them, actually. Um, whoops. All right, please stand by. I think we lost our presenters here. They are on a boat, and the bandwidth is not that great on the boat. So... We'll have to sit here and um, anyway, this gives us um, a moment to, uh, for all the students, I know that some of you will be switching classrooms and um, moving on here in a little bit. Um, Monica was hoping that she would have uh, some time to uh, get your questions and hear from all of you. So let me see if they're joining us again. Yeah, so if anybody has questions, maybe you can um, relay them through the chat. In the meantime, um, we just have to stand by. And again, if you're in a classroom or you have to log out and, and go someplace else, just let us know. And uh, this event is being archived so if they come back on, okay, let's see. Um, see if I see them on yet. Don't see them come back on. They might not know that they disconnected, but they probably should have figured that out. All right, great questions. Um, if for some reason we don't hear back from the team at all, which could happen, <laughs> um, we will um, relay these questions that are in the chat to uh, Dr. Tweedy and uh, Monica, and then they can respond to them through email or through the journals online. If you think about where they're located and where you're located, it's amazing. Oops, I see. Uh, Dr. Tweedy, you're back on there. Can you hear us, Craig? We can't hear you. Can. You keep being muted. You need to unmute again. There you go. Now we saw you. Let's see. Okay. Okay. How's this? Can you hear us now? Okay. Yep, we do. Welcome back. <laughs> okay, thanks. Sorry, we've got a really uh, horrible weather here today and it does impact our, our internet connection. Uh, thanks for moving things along, Janet. Really appreciate all that you're doing, um, you and the, the whole ARCUS team. Uh, <laughs> you're welcome. So uh, this, is, this is a slide of a, a project that is funded by NASA and it's called the Arctic um, and Boreal uh, Vegetation Experiment. And uh, this particular uh, experiment is a, a mission that's, that NASA has, uh, has funded. 
And what we're doing here is helping NASA scientists design a future satellite. And so what we're, what basically is happening is that NASA has developed all sorts of uh, prototypes and new advances in uh, satellite remote sensing. And right now they're, they're running around uh, all over the, the Arctic in, in North America here uh, in their aircraft. And so they've got these prototype instruments um, that they hope eventually to put on a satellite uh, on these particular aircraft. And so we're part of a team that is on the ground actually making measurements to figure out what is it that, that these sensors are actually seeing. So we're doing all sorts of weird and wonderful measurements on the tundra um, at many of the locations that, that Monica has, has visited. And uh, we're contributing that data uh, to the, the, the NASA uh, mission. And uh, together with NASA scientists, we're helping to figure out uh, basically new ways to sample uh, tundra uh, or Arctic ecosystems uh, using this remote sensing technology. So it's technologies that are measuring um, ecosystems, but from a long, uh, from a, a remote um, standpoint. So eventually we hope to see these sensors um, uh, put up into space. And uh, when that happens, we'll be able to uh, make, the, make measurements or understand how ecosystems are, are changing over very, very large areas, areas that, that it's just not possible to go and make continuous measurements on the ground uh, over, okay? Um, next slide, thanks, Jenna. And uh, this, is, this project we call BAID, or the Barrow Area Information Database. Uh, we started this uh, project or almost 20 years ago now, and uh, what it basically is focused on doing is leveraging and documenting the history of, of research in the Barrow area. So we've, uh, we've skimmed through our historic uh, research publications and uh, we found almost uh, 19,000 research sites across the Barrow Peninsula here. And we've, in many cases, we've gone uh, from the literature uh, back on the ground and rediscovered some of these research sites. And in some cases, we've even been, been able to dig up historic data. And we've taken, um, basically what we've done is we've gone and mined and uh, digitized a lot of this historic data and made it available to the research community. And so obviously there's a huge amount of scientific effort that has gone into establishing all of these sites. Um, and as sometimes uh, that science was done before we knew anything about climate change. But some of these historic sites have proven very valuable for understanding how this ecosystem has changed over time because we've been able to go in and, and find these, these sites, as I've mentioned, and then resample those sites uh, following the same methods that scientists have described several decades ago. And so, uh, We've recently built on top of uh, this activity by establishing a network of climate stations throughout the, the region and all sorts of different researchers are using that data uh, in the various activities, scientific activities that they're doing in this, in this particular region. So um, yeah, you can jump onto our website there, barrowmapped.org and uh, you can see all sorts of really cool interactive maps and data and pictures about uh, people doing all sorts of cool things. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll uh, round off now and uh, let Janet uh, uh, finish up the, the presentation here. Sorry about that. I was jumping ahead on the slides. My, somehow my mouse is <laughs> being crazy today. Um, yeah, great uh, presentation. Um, I wanted to go back. There were definitely some questions that came up um, mostly while you were offline there for a brief moment. Um, so let's see. Um, Jonathan, um, wants to know what type of research gear do you use? And I'm not sure if Jonathan would like to clarify that, um, but you could go ahead and take a crack at it, uh, Dr. Tweedy and Monica. 
Should I go first? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, we we use all sorts of different uh, equipment. Um, the actual measurements that we we make, oftentimes we use drones, like uh, Monica mentioned, and those drones are sometimes carrying just uh, standard, you know, uh, digital cameras. Other times they're, they're carrying uh, very specific and quite expensive uh, camera systems or imaging equipment um, that essentially allow us to uh, see what the satellites are seeing um, over, overhead, but, but from a, a drone, which is obviously very close, much closer to the, to the land surface. So we see a lot more uh, detail. Um, we also use uh, coring equipment, so uh, drills, uh, lots of drilling equipment and heavy uh, heavy core barrels. Uh, so we're drilling into ancient permafrost, uh, extracting that permafrost to see, uh, and then we'll do various chemical analysis on that permafrost to basically see how much carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus and other uh, key nutrients are in that, in that particular permafrost. Um, we also use a bunch of uh, different, uh, uh, we call them spectrometers. And essentially what it does is uh, we can take images of uh, the Earth's surface, uh, but take those images as a, like a stack of, of images taken at specific wavelengths of light. So we can use that um, once again to understand what, what wavelengths of lights plants are using or not using. Uh, at different times of the year, um, and how those different surfaces uh, basically reflect light back towards space. And so we can use that to help help with our satellite-based interpretation of length, the landscape here and how it's changing. Um, there's all sorts of other things oftentimes we use, just tape measures and pencils and notebooks as well. Okay, so not all the technologies we use here is all are all advanced. Um, it, it really comes in all sizes and shapes and forms. Uh, but getting a uh, big, big part of our challenge is actually getting to the sites where we work. So as Monica mentioned, sometimes we, we hike, uh, other times we, we uh, uh, use a four wheeler or ATV. Um, most recently we've been uh, doing a lot of boating um, and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, in the springtime, we, we do a lot of work off snow machines, uh, which is a really fun experience as well. Um, occasionally, we have to take a, a small bush plane and, and at different times, uh, a helicopter as well. Okay, great. A lot of different types of things. That was a great synopsis. Uh, Seth wants to know what your daily routine looks like. So the daily routine would be um, we get up very early in the morning <laughs> and figure out weather. We do not go out into the field until we know what the weather situation is. Is it going to be a rainy day? Is it a good day for uh, the boat to go out? 20 mile an hour winds. It's probably not a good uh for the boat or depending on which boat to take because we usually have small smaller zodiacs and then recently where we are today we're actually on the big boats so we're coming to you from the big boat that we recently acquired this summer and um it also depends on is it going to be a two layer day a three layer day uh what type of boots am i going to need today am i going to be get am i going to get wet today and cold <coughs> so we usually uh, we go out into the field depending on the weather and then we also have lab days because when you you gather all the data and you gather all your samples you have to come into the lab and process everything and and get it ready for study and then we usually uh eat, eat well Breakfast is cereal and uh, <laughs> toast, that sort of thing. Lunchtime is usually sandwiches or leftovers from dinner the night before. And uh, we usually kind of take turns cooking cooking dinner. So uh, um, sounds like it's my turn to cook dinner tonight. <laughs> Monica cooked a, a wonderful dinner uh, two nights ago. It was just fantastic. Actually, it was last uh, last Every, night was my cooking day. Yeah, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful soup that we had. 
um, and that's it. So yeah, we usually start the day, uh, I know between six and seven in the morning. And uh, I don't think I've been to bed before midnight for at least a few weeks now. And I think you're pretty much the same. So yeah, been pretty long days, but uh, uh, we've, we've just got the night until uh, just a, a so um, it's actually nice to be able to sort of go to bed when it's dark now. So it's a, it's quite a quite a cool experience. Okay, so uh, your bandwidth was giving us a little bit of issues there, and you might be frozen at the moment, but I'll ask this anyway. Um, uh, Mamie wants to know if, if they would like to live there. So I think she's asking, would you like to live on the North Slope? Well, it takes a lot of getting used to being up here uh it is uh it's not an easy life for sure especially because um everything like uh, the resource from the airplane um and your favorite type of food available so it's it's things like that is if you don't like the cold well you won't get pretty much you know but, you know or live here they, this is their way of life. I love it <laughs> yeah just uh um just a heads up that um, your bandwidth again is kind of giving us a little bit of some issue. And also we're gonna have to start wrapping up since I know some of the students uh, need to switch gears and go to other classrooms. But before we do, um, let's see, there's two more questions that came in. Brandon wants to know how cold it is there right now. And when you were talking earlier at the very beginning, we had people post their temperatures from around the United States. so. Um, not quite as hot as Texas, I know that. So, yeah. Uh, uh, probably in the high 30s today. Um, yeah, we're, we're standing inside the... Just before... Okay, our lives are a little bit more comfortable. Um, yeah. So, how hot is it in uh, Santa Teresa today? No, if somebody from the school wants to answer, you're welcome to unmute yourself and respond. Okay. All I see, I don't know. Um, it's been in, uh, at least, I think they said 90s earlier. Um, oh, 100. Yeah, about a hundred. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it usually really hurts when we get back from our summer, uh, you know, having spent several months up here and we walk out of El Paso Airport into a hundred degrees. It, it's quite a shock. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Um, and we'll take this as our final question and wrap it up. So Kim um, wants to ask you um, a question for Dr. Tweedy. It says, Monica says the new boat has arrived. When will you be able to get out on the water and which projects are you hoping it will support? Uh, good question. Uh, we we actually received the boat. Uh, it came up uh, on the back of a truck and several barges to to get to Alaska and uh, to the north to northern Alaska to uh, a place called Dead Horse or Prudhoe Bay, and that's a, a large oil field that's about uh, 200 miles uh, east of us, and so. Essentially, uh, we went over there and picked up the boat and we put it in the water and the first bit in the boat was a 200 mile uh, boat trip. Uh, 
Uh, You're frozen up again. Already. Okay. I think now we got you again. No, we um, we don't hear you anymore, Dr. Tweedy or Monica. And you might have been disconnected altogether. Hmm. Okay. So um, they are now gone, and um, <laughs> I think we got a little bit of that. Sorry about that, Kim. Um, hopefully, uh, you can post your question online, and we'll um, see how uh, if they can respond there. Um, I just want to thank everybody for uh, joining today, and thank you to the National Science Foundation for um, funding Polar Trek and for Arcus hosting um, the program. Uh, with this, uh, Judy and I are going to sign off, and uh, we'll stay here for a little bit to see if um, Dr. Tweedy and Monica join us, but our program has officially ended. Um, and again, we will be uh, posting this recording online, so if you want to share it or look at it later, you're welcome to, and we'll send it out to everybody that's registered. Um, just a heads up that we have more events like this coming your way. There's one actually tomorrow with a uh, teacher that is in Tulik Field Station, Alaska. And we have another one coming from uh, a ship in the Chukchi Sea next week. So go to the Polar Trek website to sign up for those events as well. And uh, thank you, everybody, and have a great day.